All right, so now I'm going to make a science video. I've used a lot of math videos up to this point. Once again, my videos are on my YouTube channel. I made my YouTube channel easy for you to remember my name. It's my first name, Trace, T-R-E-S, which is Spanish for three, space, Barker, B-A-R-K-E-R. -E you type it in, I'm going to pop up. I think I'm the only Trace Barker that has videos on YouTube. May not be, but make sure it's me. You can tell it's me. I'm in it. This science video is going to be touching on some of those final things that we need to understand before we go home on Christmas break. Because after Christmas break, we're going to start our, our life sciences. Life sciences are going to be looking at the organization of life, what makes us life, and the differences between the different types of animals that are out there, the environments that we need, live in, the ecosystems that we need, the things that we need to survive, food webs, food chains, omnivores, comnivores, detritivores, all these different things that you also need to know going into seventh grade. So I still have another year of teaching to do before the end of sixth grade. Um, so we're going to finish up this semester with a video to touch on two things that I know are going to be on your I step test because they have been for the past several years. One of them, which I don't have any slides for, but you're going to see in just a moment because I want to make this more interactive here, um, is a triple B balance scale. Big fancy word for a scale that I can move some measurements on to get a uh, mass of an object. What the video is, or the slides are about, are graduated cylinders and beakers. How do I measure things? Now, when we're talking about measuring things with graduated cylinders and beakers, we're talking about liquids. So I can have all sorts of different sizes of beakers. For example, in my science lab, some of the things that I still have, uh, but not much of, I can have a beaker like this, which is only 40 milliliters. It's rather small. But I can also increase in size. This one is a 200 milliliter beaker. And I go to a 400 milliliter beaker, getting bigger. I also have a 600 milliliter beaker, a 1,000 milliliter beaker. That's pretty big, isn't it? You know, it's the size of my hand. But if I'm doing something really big in science and chemistry, I can also have a 4,000 milliliter beaker. I've never used this other than to show students how big they can get. There's even bigger beakers out there than these. So it really depends on what you do for your job and what size beaker that you would use. The same idea for graduated cylinders. I can have all sorts of sizes of graduated cylinders. This by no means is the smallest one, but it's the one that would show up best on the camera. This is a 25 milliliter beaker. I have a 50 milliliter beaker, which is an average size beaker. What would be considered a large beaker that we would use would be this one that has some liquid in it that we're going to use here in just a moment. That's a 100 milliliter beaker. But I can get some bigger ones too, once again, depending on what my job is and how big I need to go. These things are huge. Once again, I've never used anything this big for any chemistry that I've done, uh, but these are pretty large. This is a 4,000 milliliter beaker. This is a 500 milliliter beaker. So really depending on what you do for your job, would depend on how much liquid you need to measure. But understanding how these work is what we need to be able to do. Because you're going to see a problem on your I step test that's been there for you know, six, seven years now at least that I can remember. And I want you to be successful with it even though it's only one question. Maybe two. The other aspect to this is these are tools that I'm going to be using if I was you for the next several years. You're going to be doing chemistry and uh, experiments, excuse me, in seventh grade, in eighth grade, and your high school science classes. One of the reasons we can is I no longer have a science lab. My, my equipment was uh, thrown away. I, I don't have the tools that I used to. I used to do science experiments every other Friday. So I did several of them throughout the sixth grade year. And my class period was a lot longer back then. Also, I had 40 minutes to teach my science in. So my time's gone down, so I have to do everything really quick. But I also don't have most of this equipment anymore. In seventh, eighth grade in your high school classes, your classroom is a science lab. Kind of jealous because they get to do as much as they want and have access to all the tools that they could possibly need to do these experiments. So when you go into Mr. Brozers or Mr. Hawkins' seventh grade class, I want you to know what you're doing. I want them to see, ah, 
The grade of a well students know how to measure with graduated cylinders and beakers. So when I look at them, they tell me the amount of liquid they will, they will hold in volume. Volume, we've talked about math, right? But we've used regular shapes. I had a length, I had a width, I have a, have a side or a height, and I multiply those three together. That's how much goes inside of the container. We found volume for cubes, we found volumes for rectangular pyramids. After Christmas, we're gonna do triangular pyramids. We're even gonna do volume of cylinders, because those are things that you might be asked on the I-STEP test, but that you also need to know going into seventh grade. Measurements and information that's on them. Notice this one has a 20 degrees Celsius. So what that means is you don't want to put anything colder than 20 degrees Celsius into this graduated cylinder, because if you do, it's going to shatter. It's glass. So we have some tempered glass, which means there's a temperature to it, um, that it's been treated in some way. Anything colder than the temperature that's on it is going to cause problems. If I poured liquid nitrogen into this graduated cylinder to measure it, it's going to shatter into pieces instantly. I don't want to do that. I also notice that on these, I have a volume of 250, but then I have a zero here. If I look at the measurements, this one goes from zero to 250. This one goes from zero to 250, but going down. So if I know that I'm going to fill in some container that's an irregular shape, and they ask, well, how much will it hold? If I start at 250 milliliters of water, and I pour it into the irregular shape, and then once it's full, I can see how far the water went down. So if I went to 250 and I dropped all the way down to 140, then I can do a subtraction problem. 250 minus 140 tells me how much liquid went into that irregular shape. But there's two key things to understand in how to measure and, uh, and identify the volume of these liquids inside graduated cylinders and beakers. The first one is the word meniscus. Now, there are two different meniscuses that you may, may have heard of. The one in science, you probably have it. In health, it's very possible, especially if you're an athlete or you're related to an athlete. We have two main meniscuses in our body that we uh, also look at in health that can get injured. My rotator cuff, which is a, an area in my ball and socket joints inside my shoulders. And then I, the other main one is in my knee, underneath my kneecap, between my upper leg bone, my femur, and my lower leg bones, my tibia and fibula. Those are meniscuses that can get injured and torn, and you may have to have surgery on it if they're damaged too bad. But this meniscus is a completely different idea. Same word, pronounced the same way, but totally different definition. This meniscus means the low point of the water table of a liquid. Okay, so water table, a table is something that like has four legs and has a flat top, right? So a table is the top of it. Water table, so we have liquid that we're talking about. So the top of the water, meniscus is the low point of the top of the water, of a liquid. So when I look at the type of items that I'm using, I'm using cylindrical or circle with height objects, a beaker, has a larger diameter so my edges don't curve up that much but the smaller the diameter gets on these tubes the more the edges curve up maybe you've noticed it, and maybe you have it that when you take a drink through a clear straw and then you look at it number one the water inside of it is higher than the actual water in the drink but if you look really close you can see that there are edges of the liquid inside the straw curve up on the edge of the straw so we have water tension or uh, surface tension that's happening there that pushes the edges up a little bit. So pushing the edges up a little bit inside the straw is not the top of the water table, but it's the low point. So one of the questions that's been on the I-STEP test is an image like this, and it just simply asks, well, what is the measurement of the liquid inside of the graduated cylinder? If I choose 27 milliliters, because that's where the edges touch, I've chosen the wrong answer. I have to look at the meniscus. The meniscus is the low point of the water table for the liquid. So this would be the meniscus. When I look at this bigger graduated cylinder, it would be here. And on this one, it's kind of hard to see because once again, that curve doesn't happen very much, but it's going to be there in the center as well. 
the meniscus is always going to be found in the center of the container. That's always going to be the lowest point for the liquid. But I have to locate where the meniscus is and look, then look at the measurement of it. Now this question has always been a multiple choice question. I don't know what the numbers are. Um, this is just an image that I found. But when I find the meniscus, then I have to find the measurement. It's not these edges. It's not 27 milliliters. It's actually 26.9 milliliters. And I know it's 26.9 because I count all the little tick marks and there are 10 from 26 to 27. So I know it's 0.9. So 26.9 milliliters would be the right answer to choose in that scenario. But the other aspect to that is I'm not always going to be on paper to where I can identify the meniscus easily. In 7th, 8th grade and high school, you're going to have to actually measure things in graduated cylinders and you have to understand what the line of sight is. You have to be able to find your line of sight. Your line of sight is you looking directly across at the meniscus. So if I pour something into a graduated cylinder and I just stand up and it's down here, then it looks like my meniscus is actually lower than it is. I can't see the measurement very well. If I'm down below when I'm looking up, it makes it look like the meniscus is actually higher than it is. And so I can't see it very well. So these are not my line of sight. I'm too high or I'm too low. I have to be able to adjust my body to where I'm directly across from the meniscus. So if I'm at an eye level and I don't have to do anything, that makes it pretty easy. When it's on a piece of paper, it's pretty easy because they show it to me and I don't have to worry about it. But when in real life, I may have to drop down. It may be on a science table, it may be on my desk, okay? But like with these desks, we're good to go. If I had tried this in last year's desks that slanted with the top, that throws the whole thing off. So I have to make sure my table is level that I'm doing it on, and then I adjust and I drop down and I look across to that meniscus to see what the measurement is. The other thing which I'm going to demonstrate for you here in a couple of minutes is the, the idea that I can use my meniscus and my water table and an actual measurement to find the irregular shape of a volume. So once again, if I take this science magnet, which is used in chemistry to stir things, with a, it's called agitating, but if I needed a chemical then to be agitated for an hour, I don't want to stand there in a beaker circling with a spoon or a stir stick for an hour. So I put it inside of my chemical and then I have a magnetic plate underneath that turns this. North-South pole causes it to turn constantly. And then I can turn it faster, I can turn it slower, and I can turn it for any amount of time that I need to. But once again, rounded ends, it's got this bump in the middle. It has straight sides, but there's got a whole bunch of straight sides. This is an octagon shape. I can't do a length of width and a height of this to get the measurement, but I can do water displacement to get the measurement. So what that means is if I look here, I'm starting with 100 milliliters. I want to drop an irregular shaped object into it. And then I look at how high it goes up. It goes up to 225. I can figure the volume now of this irregular shape by doing a very basic math question. So if I look at it and I have 100 that I'm starting out with, and then I drop the object inside and it raises up to 225, then all I have to do is my make sure I have my line of sight, but I'm going to look at it and then I'm going to subtract it. So my 225 that I ended up with, subtracting the 100 milliliters that I came back to, gives me 125 milliliters. So that irregular shaped object has a volume of 225 milliliters and I didn't have to do a length, a width, and a height of multiplication to figure it out because there's no way to, to actually measure those. So one of the things, once again, that we're going to start with is the idea of a triple beam balance scale. Now I'm going to make some adjustments here to be able to do this just so you're going to be able to see it better on the video. I'm more worried about you seeing it on the video than being able to see my face. Triple beam balance scale. This, once again, has been on the I-STEP test for the past several years. It's called a triple beam balance scale because I have three different beams here. It's a balanced scale because right now it's pretty much at zero. This is my weight pad. So if I set something over here, it's not going to go back down until I find the balanced scale. Now this goes up to, I believe, um, five, 
510 grams. But what we're going to use is we're going to use my Mr. Barker mug that Duncan Reed got me when he was a sixth grader. Now, I'm always going to start with the center one because it's my heaviest measurement, and I'm going to see if it even goes beyond the 500. So actually, there's 610 grams for this. See, 100 doesn't work, 200, 300, 400, five, well, 500 is too much, isn't it? So I know I can't go to 500, but 400 didn't cause it to, to balance out, so I'm going to start with 400. Then I'm going to go to the back one. So I measured in hundreds here, now I'm going to measure in tens, so 10 grams at a time. I'm going to move to the 51st, still not going down. Started to go down, so I know I'm getting close. 580, that's or 480, that's too much. So I'm going to have to reset to 470. Nope, still too much. Notice here it's not at the zero. So I go to 460. All right, so 460 isn't enough to push it down. So then I go to the ones. So these are actually broken up into milligrams with the little tick marks. And then each big one is a gram. So when I bring it out, I want to get this to be balanced at zero. So I slide it over until it becomes balanced. Now on these, I'm not real particular about getting a perfect thing, but what you saw on the I-step test last year was an image with the weights where they were supposed to be, and it asked what the weight or what the mass was in grams according to the triple beam balance scale. So I had to use the 400 plus the 60 plus the 8.2. So 460 is 460 plus 8.2. So this was 468.2 grams of mass for this item. The other thing I wanted to demonstrate then is the idea of water displacement or liquid displacement measurements. So we talked about the chemistry magnet, stirring magnets. Okay. Well, I have several of them. So what I did is I took one and I simply attached this paper to it or this uh, ribbon to it with a dab of hot glue. It's not going to change the volume of it. But then I have this graduated cylinder, which is a medium-sized graduated cylinder. But when I set up the video, I noticed that my line of sight wasn't where I needed it to be. So I'm going to actually use a stack of books here, which would be the same idea of you dropping down and getting into your line of sight. So once I have it set up, turn it to where you can see the measurement, I have 50 milliliters in it. I never want to just drop something into a graduated cylinder because most of them are indeed glass. So things like this have to be lowered and they have different tools that you can use. That, but that's why I put the hot glue and the ribbon on it. So when I look at it, I started at 50, and notice that it's gone up exactly 10. So when I talk about that, then I'm talking about having a volume of 10. Because if I start with 50 and I end with 60, 60 minus 50 gives me 10 milliliters. So that's water displacement. The last thing you're going to do today is I've given you a piece of paper to identify the meniscus and measurements inside of a couple beakers and graduated cylinders. It's pretty easy to do and it should be a really simple A for you to bring back to me tomorrow. And some of you are really close on your grades of getting a little bit of a better grade on your report cards that I have to calculate on Fridays. So please take advantage, do the assignment, get an A on it, ask me questions if you, there was something you didn't understand. Bring it back to me tomorrow finished and then I can raise your grade a little bit.